So hello, my name is Bill Simpson. I'm at my home in Golden, Colorado. It's Sunday, April 5th, 2020. This is a video for my philosophy students at Metropolitan State University of Denver. So, last time we saw that philosophy was in a shambles in the wake of Descartes' failure to get us beyond the bounds of the cogito, the Cartesian, I think. And we saw how David Hume opted to embrace the suck. In the venue of philosophy of mind, we saw that Hume sees only two sorts of mental contents, impressions and ideas. Impressions are more forceful or vivid perceptual experiences, and ideas are copies of impressions. We also saw that Hume considers philosophical concepts and abstract concepts generally to be cogent only insofar as we can trace them back to impressions. Hence, causation, for example, turns out to be a much more hinky notion than we expected. And the mind itself turns out to be much less substantial than we might have assumed. So now, let's turn from Hume's philosophy of mind to Hume's epistemology, that is to say, how Hume tells us about what we can know and how we know things. So, what's a proposition? A proposition is a statement that can potentially be shown to be true or false. For example, let's pretend that it's 1930 and I say something like this. There are craters on the dark side of the moon. Now this is still a proposition, even though I have to wait 35 years to confirm it. Now, on page 15 of the inquiry, Hume says that there are only two kinds of propositions, and we can distinguish between them by how they are verified. On one hand, we have matters of fact. These are discoverable by experience. Hume's example, how gunpowder or magnets work. Their contrary is still possible. You know, for example, if I were going to say the California Zephyr will arrive at Union Station at 9 o'clock this morning, its contrary, that it won't arrive, can also be true. Further, Given what we've already said about causation and sense experience generally, statements about matters of fact are always going to be highly uncertain. On the other hand, we have relations of ideas. Hume says that these are, quote, discoverable by the mere operation of thought. Or we might say that relations of ideas are known from first principles. So, if you're aware of the postulates of Euclidean geometry, you can work out that the square of a triangle's hypotenuse is equal to the square of the two sides. In fact, all reasoning about relations of ideas really just devolves to formal judgments about equality or inequality. But you'll notice that the contrary of a relation of ideas is impossible. Therefore, propositions about relations of ideas are certain. But, they're also circular. At the bottom of any statement of a relation of ideas, we're merely asserting a relationship of identity. A is A, or A is not A. Now, there's another way to express the distinction. This is the traditional distinction between a priori and a posteriori propositions. A priori is Latin for from first principles, and a posteriori is Latin for from experience. Now, a priori propositions, according to Hume, are all tautologies. Now, that's a 
uh, a Greek word for saying that the front end of a proposition say, says exactly the same thing as the back end of that proposition. So, for example, bachelors are unmarried males. That's a tautology. So, too, is, in Hume's world, 7 plus 5 equals 12. So, too, is the statement, if there was no property, then there could be no theft. Apostory propositions, pardon me, posteriori propositions, on the other hand, are known through experience. And they're informative, but not certain. For example, a magnet attracts iron filings because of electromagnetic force. Now, this way of distinguishing between a priori and a posteriori propositions is known as Hume's fork. And it's a radical way of placing limits on knowledge. So, for example, let's think about propositions about aesthetic or moral value. So, our so suppose I was going to say something like, Miles Davis is a better musician than Justin Bieber. Well, the only way to verify that is to look at the um, subjective contents of my own mind. So, Miles Davis is a better musician than Justin Bieber is just another way of saying, Miles Davis, yay! Justin Bieber, boo! So these are just reports of my attitudes toward a thing. And that's, in that sense, they're empirical. Or let's take another one, a value statement. Rationing medical equipment should be based on life expectancy after treatment. Okay, so that's a value statement. And in Hume's world, what am I saying? Younger, yay. Older, boo. And the situation with metaphysical statements, you know, statements about how the world hangs together, for example, causation, it is even more vexed. So, let's take something very traditional. It's called the principle of sufficient reasoning. Um, Aristotle thought it was one of the rules of thought. It goes like this. Effects always resemble their causes. Principle of sufficient reason. Effects always resemble their causes. Now, let's look at that statement. It's not an a priori statement because it purports to give us new information. It's not a tautology. And it's not a posteriori knowledge either because it purports to give us certain information. Notice how it's stated. Effects always resemble their causes. So that's a universal statement, and so it can't be known a posteriori, since a posteriori statements always have the capacity of having a contrary statement to them also being true. And so, when we apply these principles to the canon of human knowledge, we end up with very radical results. In fact, the very last lines of Hume's inquiry go like this. When we run over libraries, persuaded of these principles, what havoc must we make? If we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, so theology or Aristotelian philosophy, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion.